Hello, hello. Aloha. Hmm. Mm, good to see you. Yeah, how does... We've all still sur we survived the holidays so far. <laughs> Yay. Some weary but wizened. <laughs> hmm. A lot to a lot to get through these days. <laughs> One way or the other. Ah. Oh. So please, if you feel like it, taking the time to um, just see who's here. Sometimes it's so rare for us to get to be with each other in this way. Dhamma sittings together. Lucky us. Hmm. One thing that we can appreciate is when we start to um, to settle into our bodies and are aware of seeing you know, that the the meditations can formally start there with the you might notice if you can um, start to feel kindness and relate to the sensations in your eyes with kindness. And then just as you're seeing other people, before we shut our eyes, just to kind of be aware of seeing, but then seeing with kindness, connecting with each, each person and the quilt of faces with kindness. Across oceans and prairies and fields and continents, you know, we can feel that connection of care and, and, and well-wishing. May we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. Can really connect and get that palpable felt sense of the kindness, the care, the connection. And then when you feel ready, just closing your eyes. The emphasis in the sitting is to take your time, to not be in a rush, to connect with what's happening moment by moment. And out of that relaxation of not rushing to know that we can actually receive the timelessness of each moment moment by moment, there's a nano, nano moments of timelessness, less less caught in the past or future. Just letting the attention settle within your hands. And you might go back and forth between 
getting that sensory field of sensations of your whole body for a while. And then shifting back to your hands for a while. And again, take your time. And starting to find that attunement to the aliveness of your body, just like listening to music. When you shift to your whole body, it, it's like your attention might go anywhere, just follow it, whatever calls. And it, it's like there can be a rhythm of kind of opening up the attention to your whole body. And then your hands. If it feels too rushed, just pick one hand's body. And for now, I'll just shift to our hands and the instruction. And it's that kind of remembering. It's the remembering to notice that if you're noticing a visual image, a memory, that's okay. It's a picture in the mind. And just seeing if you can let the attention settle back into this very tender, delicate aliveness. And see if you can receive the sensations there just as they are. There are words that we can suggest that are meant to help us not kind of fade away, but to get more interested, such as warmth or cold, coolness, hot. Of course, we can notice them and, and then Notice those experiences without the concept as well. But sometimes just remembering it's not my hand. not just the visual image, but it's the truth of what's revealing itself moment by moment. And it's that practice of receiving just as the sensations are happening. or heaviness or softness, vibration. And 
And you might just try just for a few seconds to see the difference if you bring some kindness or care to the sensations there. Like meeting an old friend. that you care about. Fingers, thumbs, palms. And you, of course, we get distracted and you come back and notice if there can be a little tenderness or quiet, just a quiet care. And then see when you shift to receiving sensations. If you're genuinely more interested in what's happening there. You might try that with the breath. You see if you can connect with those, the aliveness of this movement. Right as it's happening, not the memory. Notice if you can relate with some tenderness or care, or kindness. Notice then what it's like to just shift to the bare sensations again, just as they are. This preciousness of life, this vulnerability, of each breath. So holy and sacred. Noticing it appear and disappear. Whatever appears during the sitting, if you can find this way of being with the experience just as it's happening, knowing that a memory or overlay or embellishment will appear. And just bring the attention back when you can to the receiving just as it's happening.
Noticing if you can be kind or care. And shifting back to the bear experience. This can be with fear or a repeating mental pattern with joy, calm, boredom, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. With resistance itself. Coming back to hands, breath, or your whole body, or sound. When you need to anchor, No hurry, nothing to get rid of or get.
Thank you, Michelle. Hmm. It is good to see you all. A little refuge in the Sangha right now. Let's take another quick look over here. Hmm. I am in um, Ohio right now. made the decision to be one of these people who traveled for the holidays to visit my elderly grandfather here and uh you know got my booster got on the plane got over here and we're pretty much been sort of hunkered down here um at his house just a few family members and uh but still you know I've been out in the world a little bit and it's it's definitely like a it's different over here than where I'm from or where I'm used to. You know, I, I had to go to uh, Target the other day and it was just amazed that, you know, maybe half the people were wearing masks and everyone else was just coughing and <laughs> sniffling. And, and uh, and and um, looking at me with a kind of like, I don't quite know what it is, a certain sort of shock or something. I can't I can't quite describe the sort of reception I feel when I walk around uh, Target, but it, it, I think I think I can fool myself like I'm blending in. I have my grandfather's uh, like tweed jacket and or, you know like. As if anyone here, no one here wears that, right? So, I don't know. Anyway, I don't feel especially like I fit in. And, um, and so there's this sense of like how to, um, especially in these times where things feel so uh, intense and high stakes and, you know, this is like for sure like a territory where people are, many people are, you know, have very different views about things than I do based on various pieces of information, you know, that I gather. And yet it's like Christmas and I like really love Christmas and trying to kind of realizing and recognizing how hard it can be, that sense of sort of jarringness of like not feeling welcome, not feeling a sort of tenderness feeling and then feeling this sort of like lack of general care, lack of uh, carefulness, and, and, uh, and then of course, like fear of the virus and, and all of that, and um, how, how long it can take um, to get back into the sort of like, oh, feeling that, going from feeling a certain sense of assault to remembering my job as a yogi uh, to and as a person who likes Christmas <laughs> to like spread cheer and like be kind and be merry and tender and kind, you know, delicate and gentle with everyone, you know, and um, amazing to sort of see these waves and the, the reality of interaction and how that plays out. You know, I, my, my grandfather lives in like this development that's not like a historical place. Uh, so the houses all sort of look very similar and there's a pond in the center and there the apparently last year they've now prohibited um bird feeders um because of like <laughs> more wildlife become than birds send tar, send to come and there's just like a dis this taste for that. Even the, the pond had um, a, a number of Canada geese, right, that frequented it. And so they, they a couple of years ago, they ran all these geese out of the, 
out of the territory, you know, go find some other pond, you know, but actually they finally let them back because it was just like so bleak, you know, and like depressing to just have like no, no wildlife and, you know, no, nothing natural sort of in this, in this place. So I, um, I make myself a couple times go like a jog around this thing. Uh, and so I, you know, it's like I, I'll encounter people on, on occasion, you know, <laughs> and and it is amazing this sort of sense of like the, my first pass around, I'll be like, oh, hello, you know, like Merry Christmas, and I, you can't say I don't, I would be, I would feel would feel scared to say something like Happy Holidays, you know, so I try to Merry Christmas, and 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 then often like first pass, I will get like no reaction, like there will be like people will like look at me and just sort of like uh, not like no nothing you know and uh and some people sort of nod or whatever and it's like okay so then like my second pass you know I'll go around and I'll say hello again and there's a little bit more sort of like acknowledgement and what I started to realize is like by the third pass if I sort of like am goofy towards their pets there's like a warmth that sort of opens up right uh and and so then 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 there's like a then the fourth time around it's like oh suddenly everyone's like friendly and like nice and by the fifth time it's like you have this feeling or i have this feeling of like oh maybe there's like cookies if i was to stick around for a sixth time around cookies will come out or will invite me in to give me covid or whatever you know uh so this sense of like oh this the ability to have a sort of like persistent um experimental <laughs> loop <laughs> that I can kind of like return to with the same group of people. Um, and by the end, this feeling of like, you know, whether or not people can connect or whether there is a sort of like, and then of course, over a few days as people have a sense of recognition and, oh, you know, that must, there's some, some reason I'm here, and, you know, uh, that there is like a sense of softening and a sense of connection and a sense of, um, kind-heartedness you know that becomes available and that 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 um that feels real you know to whatever degree and enough you know it doesn't need to be more than that you know it doesn't actually i, I don't there isn't a sense of you know more connection might not feel actually like more of a connection but some sense of the ability over time to um find some place of um of connection you know and of of open-heartedness and of goodwill and um and how poignant that is that that it feels as distant as it does and that it feels like so many of us of course are very protected and <clears throat> um defended you know against against the connection and you know, for good reasons and for unfortunate reasons. And um, and yet it, I really do feel like it, there is something I've learned in it around like, of how much we need to be um, sort of experimental in our metta practice, our loving kindness practice, you know, the sense of um, it's not always be, you know, the sort of first, pass or a sense of like where is it safe to be connected or is it safe to feel kindness at what distance at what kind of interaction is that possible but that it's 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 necessary you know to to actually for, for the most part i mean unless you have like a very long standing sort of solid approach to metta or compassion or mudita or equanimity where you just feel like you can kind of tune into it and you're kind of like just you know spreading it no matter where you go in a kind of even um, way, then that's of course beautiful and wonderful and certainly um, not even needing the sense of connection or affirmation or um, sense of reciprocity in that. You know, there's, of course there is something beautiful in that to the, to the degree that it feels accessible to us. Um, But on the other hand, you know, it's like we have to take a little bit of a, 
I think we can take some guidance from the virus, you know, from COVID itself, the sense of like, you have to have, you have to be adaptable. You know, you have like this sense that your meta practice needs like mutations and like many mutations perhaps in order to actually feel like you're able to like get past people's defenses and get past your own defenses and get past these sort of walls and, and barriers and all the ways that people in our world are inoculated against kindness and connection and tenderness, care you know, that like we have to, to some degree, have some sense of um, playful experimentation of like, well, what is going to work here? What, what is the sort of like the method? What is the approach? Where is my willingness and my interest in kindness adaptable, right? And able to mutate in order to be a, a, a more efficient um, viral force in the world. And to think about the sense of like, oh, and you are in Target, you know, or you're in uh, the grocery store or on an airplane, the sense of like, can you make every, what does it feel like to have the agenda, like the sort of like spiritual agenda of making every encounter a super spreader event for your love and kindness, you know? Like, where is there some sense of like, oh, like, everyone around you should just be like covered in, you know, your meta, uh, no matter how defended they are, no matter how much they don't want to feel it, <laughs> you know? It's like, is there any sense of, 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 of getting that, like we need to um, kind of sometimes break out of our normal habitual ways of being with one another and whether that's in terms of like direct interaction or or whether that's in terms of um just what's happening in our minds these these routines these rhythms um these patterns of response to people and how stuck they are how boring they are you know and how unpleasant they are even for ourselves, like what a grind they are, you know, and, and of course, it's not just with strangers. And it's not even just with people who we think might be have very different opinions than of us, you know, it's like, you very well may have had holidays with people who you love, who are, are very different than you, <laughs> or, or people who like, you know, you may agree with on everything. And, and, and yet there's a distance there, right, the sense of like, oh, there's a kind of, you get together and there's a little bit of a sense of just sort of like everyone's just rehearsing the same old stuff, you know, of their beliefs and their views and their crankiness about X or Y, ourselves included, you know, and um, where is there any sense of space of like, where can we kind of break out of that? And what are the sort of like mutations necessary to our practice in order to find our way around it and not get stuck in, in some of these patterns, even with our loved ones? Never mind, of course, ourselves, you know, or our neighbors, our friends, or of course, strangers, you know, that we may encounter in the world. My um, grandmother, who I never met, she died when my mother was very young. So my biological grandmother, I did, my grandfather remarried and I have a, had a wonderful grandmother um, on this side. But the one I, I didn't meet on this side um, studied English literature. So there's all these books around, including this one that I've been going through of Samuel Taylor, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I won't read this whole poem, but it's called This Lime Tree Bower, My Prison. And uh, this is like 1797. 
outside of London. I think he had a a nice country house that his he was expecting his friends uh, for a long time to come visit. He was looking forward to this visit. And right before his friends arrived, he injured himself. And so he couldn't go walking with them out in the fields and in the country. And so he had to stay under the slime tree and, uh, and watch them go have a good time. Well, they are gone, and here must I remain, this slime tree bower, my prison. I have lost beauties and feelings, such as would have been most sweet to my remembrance, even when age had dimmed mine eyes to blindness. <laughs> Looking forward to memories that right, he would cherish uh, into his old age, robbed of them, he felt. They, meanwhile, friends, who I never more may meet again on springy heath along the hilltop edge, wander in gladness and wind down perchance to that still roaring dell of which I told. And so his friends are off and having this glorious adventure and he's stuck with his, whatever it is, busted ankle under his lime tree, Bower prison. But as he starts to reflect on the good times that they're having, he himself gets very inspired and motivated and excited, you know, and ye purple heath flowers richly are burn, ye clouds, live in the yellow light, ye distant groves, and kindle thou blue ocean. So my friend, struck with deep joy, may stand as I have stood, silent with swimming sense, Yea, gazing round on the wide landscape, gaze till all doth seem less gross than bodily, and of such hues as veil the almighty spirit, when yet he makes spirits perceive his presence. A delight comes sudden in my heart, and I am glad as if I myself were there. Nor in this bower, this little lime tree bower, have I not marked much that has soothed me, Pale beneath the blaze hung the transparent foliage, and I watch some broad and sunny leaf, and love to see the shadow of the leaf and stem above, dappling its sunshine. He goes on. Henceforth I shall know that nature never deserts the wise and pure. No plot so narrow be but nature there, no waste so vacant, so vacant, so vacant, but may well employ each faculty of sense and keep the heart awake to love and beauty. This understanding of um, very powerful, I think just beautiful image and story that is not unlike the, the Buddha's own story of um, his remembrance as an older person who had gone through all kinds of austerities, not older, as a, as a young man, gone through all kinds of austerities to uh, attain enlightenment and then remembered as a, as a young child sitting under the rose apple tree in his father's uh, fields and watching his father and workers work and this sort of gentleness came upon him that was very inspiring and this, this soothing quality of heart of deep absorptive concentration that had a quality of joy that was so peaceful um, that allowed him entry into um, the sense of perhaps how he should approach his uh, spiritual practice to attain liberation and Coleridge here, you know, starting off in the sense of like, oh, you know, we we have these high expectations of gathering together and, um, you know, coming to see our friends and families and loved ones. And then whatever might happen that would sour that or not make it the way we, we think it should be. Um, but that, that like similarly, right, under the shade of this uh, lime tree, um, seeing his friends enjoying themselves in the distance, that there was something about um, the quietude of where he found himself that gave him entry into a sense of mudita and joy 
um, appreciation and, and sharing in the happiness of his friends, even if he couldn't be out there with them. Um, and in some ways, something more sublime, right? There's something more um, beautiful. And you read it of like how happy he is to see his friend who's been sort of weary from city life and has longed to be in the forest and to see him, his spirits be raised. Um, and this this joy that he takes in the joy of his friends and the sense that actually anyone who has any amount of nature to be able to appreciate um, can have has access to uh, beauty and what does he say? Nature never deserts the wise and pure, no plot so narrow be but nature there, no waste so vacant, but may well employ each faculty of sense and keep the heart awake to love and beauty. And how important this metaphor but ultimately uh, is practical instruction around finding some shelter, <laughs> right? Finding some beautiful space in order to abide in that may be at some distance from those around us, that may be at some distance um, from the joy or the sorrow, right, that we're observing, but that there is something very beautiful in this dynamic and this relationship um, that, and, and this, the sort of seclusion of it and the ability to find beauty in that seclusion that actually gives the heart opening to rejoice in the joy of others, or of course, feel compassion for the pain of others. I mean, this is, of course, it's very nice that Coleridge and the Buddha had these lovely places to uh, abide in um, with these, you know, beautiful landscapes. And we don't all have that, of course. And and that that's the next sort of most important part of like, well, this isn't just the sense of abiding under the tree and watching these beautiful things happen. It's in your people enjoying themselves. We may be visiting family and sitting under the Christmas tree and watching our families arguing <laughs> or watching them drone on about some endless thing or, uh, or whatever, you know, and the sense of where where do we learn? Where do we have some sense of appreciation for um, what it means to get involved and to be very much in the thick of it? And uh, where do we remember the teachings of the practice of, of finding like, what is the sort of psychic space we can cultivate around ourselves, even if it isn't literal space or physical space around us, that even amidst others, that there is a way of creating a sense of psychic space, right, of kindness, in our own hearts and minds, this lime tree or this Bodhi tree or the Sal trees or whatever the various kinds of trees uh, throughout the ages, you know, that people may have found some solace under uh, the cherry trees, right? You read some Saigyo poems, the sense of like, where, um, where do we cultivate that internally? Where do we have a sense of connection to, to loving kindness or to compassion or to appreciation or to equanimity amidst whatever is happening, whether it's a joyous occasion, whether it's a very difficult occasion, um, where do we remember and recollect the sense of doing that, but also not forgetting that like, and people have brought this up, I think over the last few months in a way that's been important of like, where are these qualities of loving kindness and compassion and appreciation and equanimity, perhaps a little bit distant, right? You think of this metaphor of like, you know, watching these sort of people in the distance and the, the joy or the peace, peace of mind that can come from that, that there is something there, right? There is sometimes a need to sort of withdraw energetically from a certain dynamic, certain aspects of relationship, and that that can be difficult to value, right? That sometimes it's like the intensity of the relationship, the intensity of the joy or of the, you know, the com complicated dynamics we may have with friends and family um, that, 
that's what feels like the real connection. And that sometimes this kind of love that might actually be a little bit more impersonal, right? The sense of like, oh, where is this, this quality of love that we feel maybe with our family and that it's the same quality of love we can feel with total strangers or people at Target or people who feel like they're aversive to us, like that there's something about that quality that is not as satisfying at times as some parts of what we're used to being satisfied around our kind of some of our most intimate relationships. And yet it also often will come with those entanglements and that hardship and the strife as well. Um, and so where is there a, a trust in part of this process has been, you know, over the last weeks, people have mentioned of kind of like disenchantment and where is there a sense of sometimes loss in that? but a beauty it's like well there might be a little more distance but there's a, a be more beautiful quality of heart that's available there and why and and do we value that do we do we recognize that as actually healthier for us healthier for the people around us um and not be so not have our ability to feel tenderness towards people so caught up in mm, shared views or non-shared views or whatever, you know, kind of history or blood relation or whatever they might be. It's a, it's an amazing time to explore this for different, I mean, and of course some folks, everyone's doing different things. People, some people have really stayed home and stayed quiet. Some people have gone out more, some, you know, there's of course the whole range of experience, but it was amazing on the, the flight over, there was a little commercial on the airplane of like a, from Marriott, who were they were it was like a they didn't mention covid but it was like a, obviously a post-pandemic commercial of like now like it was all these people coming back together for the first time so you see like grandparents seeing their little children coming out of the airport and uh friends who hadn't seen each other in a while like embracing and falling into the pool together and everyone's just like so ecstatic to be seeing each other after all this distance you know and um and of course, that, that some people are having that experience. And, and to, be, to be clear that many people are not having that experience too, right? Many people are seeing people they haven't seen in a few years and it's like kind of the same, you know? And um, maybe there's a sense of, of missing out and the, oh, like where's that sort of visceral joy of, of coming back together? And of course, some people are having that and it's wonderful. But then of course the Marriott commercial isn't then like a week later at the Marriott, like what are, how are all these people actually doing with one another, you know? Um, the the reality of, <laughs> of, okay, so there's that moment and then what, you know? So just this sense of like, oh God, there's, some people are having the experience for sure of like finally seeing each other. And, and even if it's wonderful to see each other, everyone's just like bedraggled and like exhausted and terrified. And, you know, we're all a little weirder for sure, you know, and a little like, <laughs> like, like haven't maybe been re reflected. Some of our, <laughs> our, our weirdness hasn't been like reflected back in like socialized ways, you know, uh, and for a few years. And so this sense of like patience with ourselves, patience with our loved ones or our friends or, you know, new people we meet or, you know, what have you, but this sense of like finding a place of care, finding a place of connection, knowing that there might have to be some adaptability, right, of like what our approach is to finding it including seclusion, including a sense of maybe looking for a flavor of loving kindness that is different than what we think it should be, right? That it's not always the commercial version of it. Um, it's not always the holiday commercial version of it, for sure, right? But that it might be something much quieter, much more balanced, um, sometimes maybe even a little bit more distant, um, but there is something very pure um, in that that's, that's worth exploring and, and worth developing for sure. I think that'll be it. I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, for today. Um, I hope there was something helpful in it for, for some folks. And um, as usual, you know, we do have some time for questions. If anyone has any about um, 
your practice in particular, talk, um, Michelle's instructions, whatever might be helpful. The easiest way, again, is if you click on the little reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and raise your hand, your Zoom hand, we'll see that. Or otherwise, you can type something into the chat to let us know you have a question. Hi, Annie. Oh, hold on. Let me make sure. I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. And Michelle, your, your um, meditation was very, um, it was very powerful for me because I have gravitated towards doing body-centered meditation for years. And, um, and what happened to me today I, has happened before, but it was just very interesting. My, you kept bringing attention back to the hands and my hands were disappearing and becoming just a field of energy that had no boundaries. And that started moving up my arms. And, and I've had this experience before, but the other pattern that I was dealing with was this point of discomfort underneath my shoulder blade on the left side. And it's not, it used to be so painful that it would um, lead me to not ever wanting to go to a weekend retreat or a longer retreat because I couldn't handle it. Well, I've, I've taken, I've, I mean, I've learned some skills for dealing with it, but it was so interesting. It was just niggling, niggling, and it was there. And I held it with kindness and talked to it and said, dear one, I, I feel this. I care about, I care about your pain. And, um, and I had this flash of sadness and wondered whether all my sadness was kind of focused in this one spot. But as my body was disappearing, my face was disappearing. I just had this one spot, this one spot. And, you know, I used to, in my past, I used to um, try and alter my position, move. Um, and I got so that I could do slight movements that no one would ever know. <laughs> but I would make these adjustments. Today, I wasn't making any adjustments except for once, I couldn't help myself. I had to make an adjustment. So I just thought, I, I just wonder what you think about all of that. I would like to share a story first, which is, um kind of fun, um, I think the, the first three months retreat I taught, I had a, a student who was, you know, it was toward the end of the three months, was having an experience like you're describing. So that's why I'm telling the story again and again. He'd come in for interviews, but he had a bigger spot than you described in, and you're like, you're having a left shoulder, but he had like a big spot in the back of his, like head that was um, much more, as, as he described it or as you described it, but you know, like a very annoying, um, intense area of uh, tight pressure back there. And um, kind of like teasing out and teasing out and teasing out how he was relating to it. He, 
and this is this is the early days you know this is like early 80s right he said um i know i know i'm gonna be able to get enlightened if i can get rid of this pain you know it was classic you know but it was he was so sincere he's like i know if, i know if i can just get if this goes away then i'm gonna i can even get fully enlightened like like and it was so like it was so um innocent and um of course my job <laughs> that's the end of that story <laughs> really but like the um the path the path of especially when we start having these experiences of what is appearing is getting more refined and and is it's more it's actually considered to be a more truthful level of reality right the non-conceptual reality it's like more close to the less conditioned and less conditioned not based on memory memory not conceptual it's like um there are these places in our bodies that um or minds that are tighter that are harder that are not appearing as refined uh yet and um there are our best teachers and the reason i i was saying that to him then and i'll continue to say it is that um when you distill down the the Buddhist teaching, it comes right down to this very spot of like in the present moment. Um, how are we, we relating to something unpleasant? And it, it's simply that it's that it's simply unpleasant and that it's simply that there's the hidden object. So we might be able to open to that it's unpleasant, but then we're missing the hidden object, which is the aversion to it. And that, like that, the reason why it's a great teacher is because um, in those moments, we keep thinking it's going to be okay if we get rid of that pain, right? It's going to be, it's going to, or if it gets more refined. But actually, it these places are teaching us how to how to be mindful of aversion, right? Do, but but you said, and but like. Said. But I really want to, I want to try to emphasize for all of us the profundity of this, the profundity of it. I'm so glad you brought it up because what, what we keep missing is the profundity of it, that, that when there's something, particularly when it's consistent, you know, over time, like you've described this one spot, which we all have these places that, um, and that, um, The teaching is, is that it's the resistance to what's happening that is the suffering. And so where the practice is here is, is again, I can say simply, but profoundly being able to see very clearly that, that it's not your aversion. It's not my aversion. It's simply aversion to unpleasantness. And that it's the liberation, how you get fully enlightened is by not resisting that unpleasantness, not resisting the aversion, but not identifying with it, not taking it personally. And so here we have this incredible body that of course will have this range of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And the point of this practice is not to get rid of pain and in the body. And that is like really hard for human beings to accept. You know, it's like, um, if we have lived long enough, we do see that it doesn't seem to be the point of life itself either, that we can't get rid of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, right? But it's certainly with the practice, it's um, the Buddha taught that the human realm is the best place to get free because there is a, is a mix of pain and pleasure and neutral and that it's not all pain and not all pleasure. Um, and so that this is so, to me, it's so, wonderful that you're bringing this up so so just again to reassure you that as it gets more and more refined more and more refined these these places in the body or mind are going to become more glaring 
And a, a, another way to say that would be, of course you want it to go away. You have to accept that. Like that's part of the process is of it. Like, you know, the first reaction is you say, oh no, not this. It's usually, oh no, not this again, right? It, and we, we, we feel like, oh no, I'm gonna get defeated by this again. And it's being able to see that we get defeated by not being able to be mindful of the aversion. And some do is that how I want I see you kind of that yeah, I yeah. I I definitely appreciate the reminder that it's all about <laughs> allowing the aversion to be. And I've watched the aversion over the years. I have less and less and less and more and more kindness. And I've accepted that it may never go away. Um, uh, <laughs> but it does not eliminate the pattern that I still have, the aversion, and less and less of the need to adjust and That's make it right. go away. Right. And, right. Um, and more interest, I, I'm maybe playing with more interest in the aversion. That's a great place to play. Yeah, because that's where the freedom is gonna be, right there. Yeah, of course I wished that my whole body would meld with the environment around me. But of course I had that one place. So it's just a, a really interesting. And in that's what, that's why I told the story of this yogi because yeah. it was so great. Like that's like, this is human. This is all of us. That story is all of us where it does do that. And we sense, we sense, oh, this is it. If I could just, if this one spot in the body would do that, it would be perfect, right? And, but that's not what the Buddha taught. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's so human. It's so human. It's, it's so um, powerful to, to get it. And I'm sure you've already had these places where you accept the aversion and you feel free. Eh, not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think, I think you've um, sort of tipped me into um, being more curious about the aversion. Uh, well, that's my job. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of you have heard me say this, but I'll just say like, it, it can get to the point, now this is an exaggeration, but what if it started to shift to, oh boy, aversion. I was hoping this would come up because I need more practice with this to get through. And this is, a, this is equanimity, equanimity that, Holy equanimity peace is that when this isn't personal, when equanimity is ripe in those moments and the aversion comes, there is, there actually is interest in it. There is an acceptance of it. And that's what I'm pointing to. I'm pointing to that possibility. And that all just, it's a matter of putting in your time and ripening and ripening. It's like, it's, it's, it happens through understanding. It happens through understanding that aversion is just as worthy of the, our attention as when the, the um, sensations are disappearing. Equal, impartial, we're impartial. Wow, it's great. Yeah. You're right at that crest. It's really wonderful. Happy, happy for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Jesse, you want to add anything? Yeah. Hi, Matt. Hi, sorry, I think I'm kind of backlit. 
but um, that's what I'm working with today. Fine. You look, you look divine. <laughs> um, just an appreciation, really, to share. Um, you know, thinking about the times that we're living through, and uh, uh, much of my practice has become book reading and short meditation when time allows. And uh, I've been reading this book, I think it's called The Beautiful Mind by Upandita. And it's just really a lovely read. And um, I started, I just started feeling grateful. Um, I was thinking back to uh, when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s and the few books that were available, you know, were, were few <laughs> and they were uh, small print and yellowed pages and, you know, dense. But this book is so beautiful. It's clear. It's concise. It's perfectly edited by Kate Wheeler of Wisdom Publications. And but seriously, it's just very accessible and, and very clear because of, I guess, the time and the exposure, the depth of practice. And there's just so much more of that available to us. And so just feeling gratitude for that, you know, to, to have all of these wonderful sources of the Dharma available to us. And um, likewise, uh, you, the teachers, uh, Michelle, Jesse, Stephen, um, just the clarity of expression and the extensive practice experience and the rich insights and the vivid metaphors. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Is that is that the book that's on like the Brahma Viharas mostly? I think so. Yeah. 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 Or there's been a lot of yeah. that. It's been really it's it's just a, a joy to read. It's wonderful. Fred? Yeah, hi, hi Jesse. Yeah. Um, I liked the, the Coleridge poem, and I'm wondering, uh, and maybe it's because you didn't read it at all, but just the, the first part where he had aversion, you know, he had these, ne these negative feelings uh, of feeling, uh, feeling left. And, uh, you know, and then he moved into, uh, you know, joy and uh, you know love, loving nature and being able to so do, do you think in his mind or is the poem uh, you know suggesting that uh, by naming the uh, the uncomfortable feelings um, he m moved and was able to create the more uh, positive uh, experiences of nature and appreciation for his uh, friends was there, was there a path there or were they, um, you know, just isolated uh, experiences in the poem? Yeah, I mean, I did not study literature, so I'm sure there's more to say about Coleridge in general <laughs> and, and those romantics and, and they're like, you know, how, do, how are they framing this? And I think, you know, th there is obviously like there's something about his their kind of reverence for nature uh, that comes, you know, that they were all that whole sort of group of writers was very, you know, invested in, in a sense of, um, you know, deeper connection that it could instill. But in terms of this, I mean, I do think that he goes into what I think we could all imagine. And I think it is an interesting question of like, where is the transformative moment of resentment that you can't be there sort of, you know, feeling left out, feeling negative about the sort of experience. And then the, the kind of rumination process that he goes through, 
around what they must be experiencing or what he sees them experiencing and then when they disappear what they must be seeing and the places that he loves and and where is that capacity of the heart to rather than kind of dig deeper into the bitterness of it to attune to the joy of all of these things that he loves and that he wanted to show them and so i think this sense of like that finding and i think this is relevant to our practice that like finding the way to love through the pain or through the aversion or through the anger or through the not wanting is actually like an important tactic uh, for all of us. And I ultimately, I do, I would say that, you know, my having read it just a few times at this point, that is my sense of sort of what happens is he gets, he starts recollecting all of the beautiful things they're seeing. And then his love for those things starts to emerge. And he is able to make this shift from rather than feeling the jealousy or the envy or the sort of bitterness of heart, that his sense of like, that they are still seeing it and these people that, that this experience is still happening and how happy he is for them and um finding that sense of shared experience and the joy and then the goodwill that comes from that and the in some ways very i don't know, I, I may have said but i don't want to I wouldn't necessarily say more sublime experience but something very profound right that's different than just having a wonderful experience yourself there's a there's a something sublime that comes through of like being so happy that that these other people are having and of course someone he cares about is having this experience um and i do think yes that for all of us that ability to to not fight the bitterness actually right and not like just Michelle is saying, it's like the aversion can't, if you, as long as you think it's the aversion that's the problem, then we're going to be stuck in this sort of like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this, or I shouldn't be wanting the thing I'm wanting, or, you know, I I would be more free if I was having a different relationship to this. It's ver instead of that, it's the like, oh, going into the aversion, going into the wanting, going into the not wanting, and feeling like, oh, what is it? You know, there's a pain of, of, of not having something beautiful or something beautiful feeling threatened um, and experienced in the future, you know, moving away from the poem, right? The sense of why do we feel these sometimes very toxic emotions? Why do we cling to them? And it's like, well, there still is through them a connection to something beautiful and that actually it's, it's going through them that often is our way in, our way of finding that deeper place of like, oh, right, there's something we love. And yes, there's a pain that we don't feel connected to it. We have lost something or we won't have this experience, et cetera, um, but that others might, or that there's a, a value to that regardless, you know, that there is a love for something and it's our distance from that thing that is the pain. But if you go into the deeper place of just the love that it's available. And I, I think you're right that there's something, yeah, just very moving about how um, he finds his way to that and then does come to these generalizations about the quality of nature, you know, and, and, and the experience for all of us in nature um, just to be able to have this or as he says you know and at the finally he talks about his friends charles he says and for thee my gentle-hearted charles to whom no sound is dissonant which tells of life right so that's like that's that's quite another level of profundity right of like it's not just the sense of oh he had a good experience and he had saw the beautiful sunset and i'm happy for him this sense of like actually that nature no matter whether it's the discord the the harmony or the disharmony or all of it because it's telling of life that it, none of it sounds dissonant like that 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 deeper place of equanimity and appreciation is available through this type of process you know so it really is a wonderful poem if anyone wants to look it up again this lime tree bower my prison um that's, that's the way i i kind of took it it felt like there was something uh causal there that uh uh opened because he was aware of those those negative feelings and uh, the next time i go to target you know and see half the people unmasked you know i might uh i might look for a a, a similar trigger <laughs> it's it's uh it's an amazing time to find uh innovative connections uh, love and kindness yeah thank you <laughs> michelle anything you want to add oh you're muted there I think that we, you've heard us encourage um, when we are not able to do what 
Coleridge is describing to actually try to find some space to be in nature in some way. Or as Matt said, he's reading, he's reading something beautiful, right? He's reading some beautiful Dhamma or like, which is nature, you know, that it's like that sense of kind of getting out of our um, rut of however we are resisting, right? To, to a place of a deeper surrender and and often I think for a lot of us nature is a place that gives us that kind of um, support it's really important you know just really important thankfully we a lot of us still have some access to nature in some way you know it's um I think that's where we all feel such uh, great gratitude to to the to the planet. And uh, I'll add, you know, that the emphasis we have on our bodies is to keep trying to re- get that sense that our body is nature, <laughs> and to to also to all and our mind is nature, and our emotions are nature, and so that um, we might find that refuge inside at times with metta, with compassion, with mudita equanimity. You know, it's a, it's a great discussion, discussion, you know. I think when I'm in Target, if I'm having trouble, I go to a department that's a little less um, crowded and interesting for me. I, I tend to go to the um, kitty treat section. It's usually not crowded or, you know, go somewhere in Target where it's a little more joyful. <laughs> There's no plant section that we have at Target here, but yeah, it's a, you can always change the channel inside the the store. (laughs) Thank you. Hmm. I have, I have something else to say about that. You know, I was thinking about um, at least where the target is on the big island, on the side of the island. Um, they don't always put them in places that are also kind of um, parks. You know, like it's it's kind of like a lot of stores that are similar uh, and. Um, way, you know, I'm sort of thinking of things that kind of go back in time, but I remember when I was first learning this practice and um, some of us on on staff at this meditation center used to purposefully go to places like the airport or Target or, you know, department stores or kind of areas that weren't full of nature to kind of, the idea was the practice was to watch our mind just to sit down and watch your mind in relationship to these places with no, like you weren't going to target to, to buy anything. You were going there to watch your mind and sit down somewhere or stand somewhere in the corner. And, you know, really for an hour, half an hour, just watch the mind. And generally what you're watching is the mind judging. And so like the idea is that you just watch the mind judge and judge and judge until you stop judging the judging and you start kind of like being able to feel metta and I think that I'm adding this in only because there is that way in which we move away from it to find strength but also there are ways to be in there I suggested going to a different part of the store but I just wanted to add um, that it is possible to bring ourselves into these situations where there is no goal other than to practice And that that's like super uh, liberating, you know, 
and it, it is draining after a while for me it's the fluorescent lights themselves you know it's just like wow you know but it's like if you do a, a lot of meta in the store um the meta infuses the fluorescent lights you know <laughs> it's a practice jesse i don't know if you yeah i know I, I just i think i, I just want to say of yeah. like of course like the target thing is like a very like pedestrian sort of example that's not that might seem sort of like silly but you know but we had you know like archbishop desmond tutu just passed away and like you have here you have an example of someone who you know was able to like have such a profound commitment to loving kindness and generosity of heart like beyond like what most of us can ex imagine even right for ourselves towards uh you know towards a whole society including like a lot of members of society that like were incredibly oppressive you know and 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 you know inhuman atrocities to to uh people that he would identify with right or towards him you know the threats to his own life and his own security and towards you know black south africans for such a long period of time this ability for someone to have this capacity and commitment to pacifism to love to healing to honesty but without at all letting go of like a commitment either to righteousness right and dedication to the you know, ethics of, of justice um, that he was so committed to. So, I mean, I, I think that it's like these, the danger in over, you know, the danger of like when we project anything onto any individual as like so far beyond what we think our capacity for love is. And, you know, it's like, it's so important to honor people who have achieved greatness and in, in spiritual ways and in, material uh you know social ways as well as he did um but of course the danger is that it feels more distant it can feel more distant from us and so like well you may not be like out there you may not feel that you're out there um you know creating a new reconciliation truth and reconciliation commission for your community <laughs> and all like whatever horrors have happened wherever you live because they have right uh it's like to not poo poo like what it is to go into a place that might feel like enemy territory or that might feel like uh at least on the edge or maybe neutral but not necessarily a supportive space for you to practice loving kindness and start to find some sense of connection to the humanity and others uh, especially with those who you might not have an intuitive sense of connection and, and uh, intuitive appreciation of their worthiness for love you know it's all important you know Iswar. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, instructions and the talk. Um, <clears throat> I just had a quick question about. So I've been trying to understand um, uh, some some concepts uh, within the context of my uh, uh, practice, and um, you know, one of them is a. Uh, Sati, <clears throat> and um, so you know, I kind of um, have, have seen it you know, translated as uh, you know mindfulness or presence of mind or you know um, keep keeping the object in the field of uh, awareness. Um, so, so uh, something I've uh, noticed is um, you know when I keep a, a object in the uh, field of uh, awareness there's kind of a you know I, I can keep it there but then you know in in order to have it stay I kind of have to um, uh, shift the perspective back and kind of have a knowing quality that you know um, there is awareness and then you know you I uh, come back to the object and I'll, I'll kind of shift back and forth but it's it's uh, subtle like um, 
it's it's uh, you know I I can only kind of see it once I get get kind of concentrated. So um, I was just curious what what uh, what that um, that uh, knowing quality uh, co corresponds to. Like, is that is that a part of sati, or is that kind of like a, a say a vichara a vitaka type of type of quality? Um, yeah, I was just curious. Yay. <laughs> Michelle, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's a great question. Um and I think, you know, coming out of, you know, your longer period of retreat recently, it's just it's sweet to get a a taste of that flavor of right, like when you're you're quiet enough to start seeing these very subtle um motions of mind, you know. Um I think I, I don't I I'd be reluctant to sit to to answer with like a concrete answer of like saying, well that is this or without you know of course I'd be curious I want to maybe have more questions as well. Um but I think that it is very interesting, fascinating, important to see. And then ultimately like the kind of deepening exploration of what's happening and the kind of like you know, these molecular experiences of sort of object and awareness and and what's happening there. I think that there is um, certainly that possibility of like what's called sampajanya, so like clear comprehension, and that that breaks down to like a few different kinds of qualities of clear comprehension. That And the, the breakdown tends to be more in terms of like the commentarial stuff, but that even as the Buddha spoke a lot about like santi, sati sapajanya of sort of mindfulness and clear comprehension as very related, but also at times distinguishable aspects of mind and of awareness um, that are important, right, to sort of see. And I think there's one way in which it feels something of what you're saying of like the kind of observation of it and then the knowing of the observation of it to kind of help stabilize it um, and understanding that it's playing that a sort of stabilizing role um, that feels important, you know, um, where is that what what are the various aspects of that knowing you know is it is, are there parts of it that are sort of conceptual are there parts of it that are um like uh elements of perception right what we call technically like you know perception of sort of recognition of this as this um where might there be times where maybe you don't need because the object is always going to actually be changing that th we shouldn't be too concerned with a very stable sati either right that the, actually that the sati is also changing like that the, the like what would it be like to see that the sati also is arising and passing or the sapajanya also arising and passing right this sense of like um where you get into the dis some of the distinguishing experiences between mindfulness and concentration, sati, and like you said, vitaka and vichara, the aiming and sustaining of the attention, and that you can't have aiming and sustaining without some mindfulness, but at the same, because you need to be, there needs to be some sati in order to recognize what you're aiming and sustaining the attention with, but at the same time, you can have, you can start to have a aiming and sustaining without much mindfulness, right, a kind of you're trying a way that you're sort of controlling the attention in a way that isn't necessarily observing it, but is just trying to kind of fix on it. And um, these, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's important to sort of see, oh, where are we sort of like, in these very subtle ways, ne negotiating in a momentary way where the sort of emphasis of the mind is and do we need it to be one thing consistently or is there a sense that it's appropriate for some kind of like fluidity and adaptability but also where do we take responsibility for what you start to see and i think is partly what you're saying is that there is also volition involved in these moments that there is sometimes a decision to aim or to sustain or to conceptualize or to know or or move the attention back and that are you also observing that right like the, the volitional moments in between all of these things happening um so i don't know that might have sounded sort of like a, a, a kind of 
little smorgasbord of responses, but I think it's it's appropriate in terms of like what you're saying that that there's just essentially to say that there's more to look at. It's important and to keep looking without stress around what you're seeing, but also that kind of deepening inquiry, you know. Uh, Michelle, you want to add anything to that? Hmm. With these kind of questions, I tend to, um, they, what always usually comes up is uh, what things that Mahase Sayadaw has said. And um, because I think all that Jesse has said is all part of it. And I think that, that the nuances of, of the, how your attention is um, kind of kind of opening up and stepping back or witnessing and then kind of going back in and um, coming back out that that um, I, I'm just kind of going to try to uh, amplify what what Jesse said that there are ways in which that gives us the ability to kind of kind of go deep inside and the object or an experience and know it from the inside. And this, this takes um, a great balance of sometimes the concentration is, is low and the mindfulness is high or the equanimity is low and the energy is high. Do you see like you're, you're starting to describe these different ways the seven factors are coming in and out of balance and that will, that will affect um, that quality of awareness and how that is working. So that's, but I think what's important is to know is that the, um, all of it is good practice. It's all good practice. But there, and there are times in which we've practiced enough so that when the mindfulness and energy and concentration and equanimity do come into balance, there is a way in which we can bring our attention to our thumb. The attention actually goes in there and knows it from the inside. And that will mean that there's this great balance. But, but to maintain that, because that means the concentration that we talk, which are the mindfulness, equanimity, energy, they're all in balance. And I'm not sure if this is helpful, but it's really important to get that the, all this stuff is often is so much in flux um, that often when we take a step deeper inside, we'll think that's better. But if you, if, so that would be my warning to be careful of thinking one, one way of this going on is not better than another. Um, but the, the idea is that um, I'll go back to good old Mahasi, like that when he described that when you're with the attention is with the movement of the breath, um, <laughs> you can be aware of the physical sensations or you can be aware of knowing it. And that's so simple, right? But that's like, that's the first foundation of mindfulness and the third foundation of mindfulness. It's like, there's, there's a way in which even what you just described is even that, that you're sort of, you might be going in, kind of going in and noticing the physical sensations, but there isn't quite enough concentration that can actually know it from the inside. So you're stepping out to know it. And I hope this is making sense because it is to me, but it, it's like you have to step out to know it because you can't really, uh, there's not enough force of energy, mindfulness, concentration, equanimity to, to stay in there. I hope, is that clear? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess one of the other reasons why I was curious about it is because it, it kind of seems like a, uh, self reinforcement, sort of, which you know, I kind of was um, apprehensive about. You know, it's kind of like you know, um, you know, saying that there is a self observing this. You know, you know what I mean. Whenever I kind of take that step back, and so I wasn't sure whether. Um, yeah, I mean, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to say that. Yeah. No, I'm really glad you said that because that, like, it's hard. The hardest is to not identify with a knower and so this is that that kind of self-inquiry that that kind of consciousness around that that you just described is great because that's when you step back into that 
it's very easy to be identified with that knower as me or I or mine. And so that would be a great place for you to explore. And I think that's what Jesse's encouraging is to, to just keep exploring that because it's so easy for us to, um, it's incredibly easy for us to be identified with knowing or being a knower. Yeah, and I, I just to, to like really just emphasize that piece of like that it's not. Don't be worried about the the idea that it is reinforcing a sense of self, but try to see if it if you if you're having that experience, <laughs> there's probably some sense of like you get that there's like, but the thing to look for is those as two distinct moments that there's a knowing moment. And then there's a sense of self that's going to come after it. Like the identification is going to be its own moment of experience, different than the knowing moment. And that that is the most important, you know, it's like, you don't have to always feel like that the identification is necessarily there in that very moment. And that you can start to sort of see, like, is there a way in which the only way we get through identification is through accepting it and understanding it and, and like really exploring it versus feeling like rejecting it or feeling like it's a problem. Right. And sort of like, where is the sense of me in the knowing? Um, is it the same moment? Is it separate moments? Whatever, you know, just that kind of like deepening exploration of it. This is, I think this is so um, fun and interesting in that I think I'm not sure Iswar, but it could be, as Jesse, um, you know, we're we're doing the duet, which is so much fun with this kind of thing. It's like um, when the attention starts to pull back to witness, um, it could be that there's a sense of um, duality that has happened that wasn't there. There was probably a subject of an ob subject and object disappears when there's a knowing from the inside of the object. And when the subject and object come back, we can feel like something's wrong. And that's what I was sort of trying to refer to. And Jesse's referring to, we're both referring to that as to be careful of thinking that that's not as good a practice because it will feel that at that point. And it's really, as Jesse's saying, it's a matter of then being able to investigate that rather than reject it. That makes sense. Yeah, it's really fun when, you know, it's like it just opens up and opens up because again, we, when we feel like, um, we kind of go in a little deeper, then we tend to at first reject a less deep experience. <laughs> it's just the way we are, you know. Then you, get, you take a little lock and target and put it all in perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Thank you, everybody. Really good to see you all. Gee, when we see you all, it's going to be 2022, right? Or, or have I lost or, all sense of time? Must we have a thing on Monday, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wishing you a happy moving through the solstice and holiday into the new year. Hmm. Take care, everyone. <laughs>